Chances are back today. They'll continue through the next several days, and we'll also get some additional snow on our mountains. Right now, we're looking at 46 degrees with mostly cloudy skies. I'm Dan Bomas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com. We're Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside, Inside Sources. America's voice of reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Well, happy Groundhog Day. No, this is not a replay, although it is technically a replay. <laughs> Today is actually Monday. Uh, it's not February the 2nd, uh, but it is Groundhog Day. Uh, because it's an important day today uh, when it comes to the politics of border security and immigration policy. Uh, we've sort of hit the twilight zone in all of this, or I think it's become what the grade school kids love. It's opposite day when it comes to what the Democrats and the Republicans are fighting against and what they're fighting for. Let's begin. Think you know the news of the day? Think again with Boyd Matheson on KSL News Radio. Well, unless you think that it is still February the 2nd and we are stuck in Groundhog Day, it is actually Monday, it is the 5th of February, and it is still Groundhog Day when it comes to immigration and border security security policy. Uh, after several months, uh, senators uh, have been negotiating a bipartisan deal. The text of that bill became uh, available yesterday on Sunday evening. Uh, first big piece of legislation when it comes to border security in a long time. But the, the question is, does the bill do what it says it's going to do? And why is everybody who used to be for it now against it and everybody that was against it now for it? And how do we figure that all out? Uh, and so we want to break it all down in terms of where we actually are. It's a little stunning to me. Uh, and it is a, the topsy-turvy world that we live in. Uh, I have listened to statements from members of the Republican Party today who have been screaming for a decade about some of the very things that are in the bill, uh, saying that they are against those very things. I, I've listened to President Biden uh, shout things that he's been against his entire time in the Senate and vice president and as president. And so why all of a sudden is everybody flipping the script? And the answer, of course, is politics. This has become purely political. Uh, in a deeper way than normal. Uh, and that's disturbing to me because we've been to some pretty bad political spaces of late uh, and we're taking it to a whole new level. And so let's break it down just a little bit. If you haven't been tracking this over the weekend, again, the uh, bipartisan bill, again, it was uh, negotiated for the Republicans. Uh, Senator Langford of Oklahoma was the primary negotiator there. You had Senator Murphy leading out for the Democrats uh, and it's gone back and forth. And the big debate and the thing that has disturbed me the most is the fact that we've had people shouting that you have to accept this deal before they knew what was in it. And you are having people shout, you have to kill this bill or it's dead on arrival before seeing the bill. So we're going to be equal opportunity offender. <laughs> They're both wrong. Uh, let's look at what's actually in the bill and we'll break that down in just a second. But let's start with Senator Murphy. He gave some comments in the hallways of Congress about the compromise legislation. Here's what he said about the need to debate and pass the bill. If Republicans believe the border is a crisis, how are you going to vote against a landmark bipartisan bill that we negotiated with one of the most conservative Republican senators on the border issue? That's James Langford. Um, I watched all my Republican colleagues in the Senate stand up last fall and say, we are not going to support Ukraine aid unless you get a bipartisan deal on the border. Well, we got that bipartisan deal. It gives the president real new powers to control the border. And many Senate Republicans are going to oppose this bill because it's too effective, because Donald Trump is telling them, no, keep chaos at the border. Don't solve the problem because that's good politics for us. Well, that's really bad for the country. Now, let's listen to uh, Senator Langford, again, Republican from Oklahoma. Uh, he talked about the details of what is actually in the bill and uh, said that everyone's just got to slow down. Let's uh, make sure we go through the process and let's actually have the debate. Are we as Republicans going to have press conferences and complain the border's bad 
and then intentionally leave it open. Now we've got to actually determine, are we going to just complain about things or are we going to actually address and change as many things as we can? If we have the shot, and it's amazing to me, if, if I go back two months ago and say we had the shot under a Democrat president to dramatically increase detention beds, deportation flights, lock down the border, to be able to change the asylum laws, right. to be able to accelerate the process, no one would have believed it. And now no one actually wants to be able to fix it and says, I don't want to even debate it. I don't want to discuss it. We have to decide as Republicans, what are we going to actually do about the border? Uh, so that was Senator Langford. Uh, and this is just getting really interesting. So uh, a handful of Democrats uh, have already come out uh, and said that they are against the bill. Uh, again, also pretty stunning. Uh, I think the most telling of those was Senator Robert Menendez, Democrat from New Jersey. Uh, his remarks were pretty scathing. Uh, Senator Menendez said, if these changes were considered under former President Trump, Democrats would be in outrage. But because we want to win an election, Latinos and immigrants now find themselves on the altar of sacrifice. Uh, that is the end of the quote from Senator Menendez saying to his colleagues on the Democratic side, hey, if this very thing would have been proposed under President Trump, you would have gone crazy. But now you want to win an election. Uh, and so you're going to sacrifice uh, some of those that are coming across under very uh, simple circumstances or very compassionate circumstances. So there are things in the bill that obviously both sides hate. Uh, which usually tells me there's probably something good in there. Uh, if everybody's mad about it, then uh, it means we're probably getting to a, a better place in one form or another. Uh, and so I think that's a, an important thing to take a look at. So as we unpack the bill a little bit, I think there are things in there that sound good, and the bill text is what matters. And this is, this is where it gets complicated when it comes to immigration and uh, border security reform, is you can title something even within a bill, and it doesn't necessarily mean that's what it's going to do. So there are things within the bill as it relates uh, to asylum seekers. Uh, some of those are components that Republicans have argued for for a very long time. And there are also some loophole, loopholes that have been added in uh, that are also concerning when it comes to asylum seekers. And, and so a lot of that you just have to keep looking at and keep digging at uh, to figure it out. And this is the reason why when we get to these big bills on big issue things, uh, we got to make sure we have enough time to go through the process properly and make sure we can vet it all out, that we can have an open, honest debate on the floor of the House and the Senate. That's the way it's supposed to work. Process matters. Uh, that members from both parties should be able to offer amendments to the bill. That's the way the system is designed. Uh, but sadly, we're getting a whole lot of we don't have time for that. We got to hurry and do this. We got to quickly do that. Uh, so we don't have time for an amendment process. So instead, you end up with this very small number of people who've negotiated this. And I think their intentions have been good. Uh, and I think they've come up with some good pieces in this. At the same time, uh, you've got 98 other senators that were not part of this process who are just starting to digest it. The House hasn't even looked at it yet, so that's a whole other story when it gets to the House side. But the House should not pronounce it dead on arrival either, by the way. Uh, they should make sure that they have an opportunity to look at it and see what's in it before they declare whether they're for it or against it. Uh, but the problem with all of this is the problem that we often come back to, and that is both sides are very happy and very content and their pollsters and political consultants have told them, this is a good issue for you. This is good for you when it comes to the 2024 election cycle, not just in the race for the presidency, but control of the House and the Senate and on down into local races as well. And I still believe, and I've been saying it all day today, I still believe if we actually just put everybody on the floor of the House and the Senate and locked the doors and started with the principles and the policies, we could solve 94% of this in an afternoon because everybody agrees. The time has passed for all of this politics uh, where we have crazy days like today where it's opposite day in Washington where people are yelling for things they've been against and are against things they've always been for, for the pure politics of it all. And that's where we have to really begin, especially when it comes to the country, to think again.
Think again on Inside Sources with Boyd Matheson. The last thing you want in the morning yeah. is more noise. The day's just getting started. Maybe you're feeling a little anxious or overwhelmed, and it's not even eight yet. So catching up on important news stories, some sense of weather and traffic, it shouldn't be stressful. Get a wrap on the day ahead from smart, inviting voices who know you're trying to ease in. Do you love a rainy day? I do, actually. I do, too. Tim and Amanda, mornings from 5 to 9. They have you covered on KSL News Radio. Does your student have a hard time getting up in the morning or struggle to fit certain classes into a packed schedule? Consider a few online classes at Mountain Heights Academy, a tuition free online public charter school. Any Utah student in grades 9 through 12 can replace a few traditional classes with high quality online courses and get the best of both worlds. Their teachers have years of experience in digital education, and all courses meet Utah graduation requirements. Learn more at mountainheightsacademy.org. The Salt Lake Chamber is Utah's voice for business. Okay, that sounds great, but what does it really mean? Well, as Utah's largest and longest standing business association, they support and champion community prosperity throughout the state. And if you're in business, well, that's a very good thing for you. Be sure to listen to the Chamber's Speaking on Business, weekdays at 7.20, 11.55, and 5.20 p.m. on KSL News Radio. Maybe Washington didn't ski. Maybe Lincoln didn't shred. Okay, could be, but I know they'd have no objections to you taking a run in their honor. So get ready. President's Weekend at Bear Lake is simply the best of Utah and the best place to celebrate our president's big days. You'll uncover three of the most beautiful cross-country and snowshoeing trails in Utah. Or jump into a snowmobile and catch some awesome trails in over 350 miles of backcountry snowmobiling. No matter how you like your winter sports, Bear Lake is ready. And President's Weekend is the perfect time to celebrate. So pack up the family and play your way. And when you choose President's Day to play in the snow, you'll find family-friendly getaway and lodging deals, too. Start at BearLake.org and learn more about President's Day at Bear Lake. BearLake.org. Lodging, activities, family events, even ice fishing. It's winter at its best. All at Bear Lake. Visit BearLake.org for details. BearLake.org. Getting your biggest tax refund from Jackson Hewitt can lead to some spirited reactions. Jackson Hewitt! Yeah. Jackson Hewitt is so sure that you'll get your biggest refund that if they don't, you get your money back plus a hundred bucks. Jackson Hewitt! And Jackson Hewitt also guarantees the accuracy of your return for life. So don't just sit there. For your biggest refund guaranteed, walk into a Jackson Hewitt today and dance out Jackson Hewitt! Yeah! God, I'm so stressed. It's a brand new year and our business is busier than ever. Uma. What is that? Meditation? I'm recommending the Uma cloud phone system with auto attendant and more than 35 features. Uma? Yep. Switching to Uma is a cinch. Starts at $19.95 per month per user, plus taxes and fees. Uma. Now you're feeling it. Visit Uma.com. That's O-O-M-A dot com to learn more. Uma. Smart communications for the smarter business. Do you worry about how much someone drinks? Do you feel neglected or unloved? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you are not alone. Al Anon and Alateen can help. Call 1 866 200 0223 or visit al help. Jeff Kaplan's Minute of News. We're committed to letting you know exactly what's going on. On our show, we're going to bring you up to speed on what's happening in the world to this moment. At the same time, the news can be really burdensome. It can leave you feeling a little bit depressed and even a little bit more depressed. My minute of news is just a moment to lift you up. I'm blessed that KSL has given me the freedom to talk about whatever I want. Literally, it is my minute of news. Sometimes it's pegged to what's happening that very day. Sometimes it might be something bizarre that you didn't know happening somewhere else in the world. To make you smile for a moment, even on a difficult day, and make you realize the world is still spinning. I am so honored that so many people have appreciated and enjoy the minute of news every afternoon. Right home with Jeff Kaplan weekdays 3 to 7 on KSL News Radio. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bomas. First, a Utah legislator wants to legalize a lottery in Utah. Voters though 
would get the final say. Second, Utah's governor says his visit to the border with Mexico makes him think the situation there is unsustainable. Third, Britain's king says he's going public about his cancer diagnosis to avoid speculation about his health. Right now, 46 degrees, mostly cloudy in Salt Lake City. Back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Get deeper insights on the news from Inside Sources. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today. As always, I am Boyd Matheson, and we have uh, mercifully come to a little bit of a lull in presidential cycle news. We're floating in between important dates, uh, of course, that will lead up to South Carolina and then on to Super Tuesday. Uh, But we want to take a quick glance today to just kind of see where we are. A few things happened over the weekend that didn't get a lot of coverage that we should just uh, make sure we have covered as uh, we start marching forward. We are exactly one month away from Super Tuesday. And that is where things really are going to hit the pavement, so to speak, uh, especially on the Republican side. But let's start on the Democratic side. Uh, President Biden won an overwhelming majority of South Carolina Democrats. Uh, Not a surprise there. Uh, Impressive, though. Uh, He uh, received over 96 percent of the vote. Uh, Every county, uh, everywhere you turned, it was uh, Joe Biden for the win there on the Democratic side. And again, not surprising. Uh, Important to note, I think this was a little bit of a reward for South Carolina. You may remember back in 2020 when uh, then-candidate Joe Biden was really struggling in the Democrat uh, presidential primary. And many had speculated that uh, if he did not do well in South Carolina, He would be out of the race. Uh, So he was in a bit of a precarious spot. South Carolina came through in a big way with some very key endorsements. Uh, And because of that, uh, Mr. Biden uh, had uh, decided that they would change the schedule when it comes to the uh, Democrat nomination process. Now, I actually think that's a great idea. Uh, I think these things should be rotated around. I don't think it should always be Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina determining for the Democrats or the Republicans who the nominee should be. I think it should be rotated. I actually love the idea, and we're going to get to former Governor Gary Herbert uh, on the show soon about this. Uh, he actually had this great idea of having these regional primaries to have a whole bunch of states uh, and divide the country up into four spaces and then rotate it every election cycle. And so that way you could have one year where the Southwest was really uh, the leading part of the presidential primary process. And then another time, maybe the Northeast or the Southeast. And you can divide it up that way. But I think it's an important part of it. President Biden clearly gave a a little bit of a a nod to South Carolina, thanking them for 2020 uh, and also really being the spot to kick off uh, his run for reelection here in 2024. Now, we also have coming up this week uh, the most confusing of primary slash caucus days, and it is days, plural, coming up in Nevada. Uh, Nevada has uh, a real interesting way on the Republican side. They will have a presidential primary, which is run by the state of Nevada. Uh, That will be uh, this week. And then two days later will be the Nevada caucus run by the Republican Party of Nevada, And that is where the delegates will actually be assigned. And in the end, that is what matters. Here's the irony of it all. Uh, On the Republican primary, so again, these are uh, primary votes, mailed ballots mailed to to voters' homes. Uh, Former President Trump is not on the ballot for the primary. And interestingly, in the caucus side of things, it's President Biden and Nikki Haley is not on the ballot. So they've sort of decided to uh, divide and conquer. So Nikki Haley will declare a moral victory uh, because she will do well uh, in the primary uh, and win that because former President Trump is not on the ballot. And then President Trump will uh, spike the football uh, and win the caucuses and uh, take the delegates that go with it. So that's coming up in Nevada. I know that's slightly confusing. You don't have to worry about it. It's going to move on real quick. Uh, Another little bit of the under the radar category Uh, I know none of you woke up this morning thinking, I wonder how the U.S. Virgin Islands new caucus system is going to work. Uh, It will be interesting. (laughs) Uh, This will be a a head-to-head match between uh, Nikki Haley and former President Trump. Um, Neither one of them have actually visited the Caribbean. I was actually making the case today that Inside Sources should go do a live broadcast from the U.S. Virgin Islands just for good, sound, journalistic quality. Uh, to make sure everything was happening properly there uh, in the Caribbean outpost. Uh, 
but that's not going to be the case. But that's coming up on February the 8th. It is a caucus system. Uh, it's technically, technically, it's the third in the nation contest. So uh, it's ahead, actually, before Nevada. Uh, the Republican National Committee reduced the number of delegates uh, representing the island from nine to four. Uh, and part of that was the territorial GOP uh, implemented a ranked choice voting uh, system and they uh, violated the uh, RNC rules, the National Committee rules, uh, that they were going to have their vote before March the 15th, uh, that those would have to be proportionally done. So a little bit of a dust up there. But again, we're only looking at a total of four delegates coming out of the Virgin Island. I still think we should go do a remote broadcast there just to make sure everything is on the up and up. Who knows? Maybe it will be the deciding factor in the nomination in the Virgin Islands. Uh, and then from there, uh, we have a big, long look forward uh, as uh, we, we look at what happens uh, on Super Tuesday. And that will be the, the real key to me, I think, because uh, Super Tuesday, again, March the 5th, which includes Utah voters, by the way, uh, that will divvy up about 874 of the Republican delegates. Now, you may remember that the number of delegates you need to get to be the nominee this year for the Republicans is 1,215. So 1,215 is the magic number. So uh, a good chunk of those are going to be up for grabs on March the 5th. So as you look at how that plays out, now that's a, a full month away. That's seven lifetimes in political years. And so what will happen in the interim? Uh, on the Democratic side, President Biden will just kind of keep marching along. So uh, he's in good shape there. No real threats. I think what the president is more worried about uh, is either uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. or no labels uh, coming in as a third or fourth party, uh, fourth ticket on the ballots for November. That's clearly where their worries are right now. Uh, they're not worried so much about the o their own nomination process. They're very worried about how this plays out in November. They have that advantage, by the way, which is important. It's easy to win uh, primaries in the spring, but the only thing that matters is can you win the general election in the fall? So that's where the president and his team are going to continue to be focused, positioning uh, for that uh, national uh, campaign and the, the big finish in the general election come the first Tuesday of November. So on the Republican side, the questions then are going to center around what does Nikki Haley do now? Uh, I know there are many who are saying it's over, it's over, it's over, and it may be difficult. It may be a long shot. Uh but there is a shot, and there is a path, and I think that's the important thing. And I don't care if it's Republican or Democrats. The establishment of both parties, the elites of both parties, love coronations. They don't love conventions, and they don't love really hotly contested primaries because they have to spend resources, and they want to save all the resources they can for the general election. And so most times and most often uh, when we have this kind of situation, again, the elites, those in control of the Democrats and the Republicans, they just want to say everybody needs to get out. We need to consolidate. We need to unify the party. Those are the words you hear. And when you hear those, you think, hmm, I wonder why they're saying that in January and February. Uh, isn't this the time to have a real good, open, roiling debate over the future of the party and the future of the country? That's what I think we ought to be doing. Uh, but instead, we're debating whether there's a possibility or a path. Uh, and that's the problem, because most of these things are self-fulfilling prophecies. Because if the big money donors hear over and over again that it's over, then they stop donating. And then it is over, because there's no money flowing to get the message out. So what will Nikki Haley do? That's a big question. Uh, will she be able to connect with younger voters? Will she be able to tie the current and the former president together? as old, outdated, and failed policies. I think that's the case. I think that's what she has to make to everybody to say, look, these policies didn't work under President Trump. They didn't work under President Biden, so let's do different. I think that's uh, the only way she can really get the traction she's going to need uh, to move it all forward. And I think there is a path. I think if she does well in South Carolina, keeps it into single digits, then I think you've got a long runway for a lot of things to happen uh, but we'll see what does happen 
uh, and what's possible on that front. So that gives you the lay of the land when it comes to the presidential race. It is a little bit of a lull. Take a big exhale. Uh, We'll look at uh, a whole bunch of other real issues that are important for all of us to be thinking about when we come back. Stick around. More Inside Sources coming up next. It's 1.30 at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bomas. KSL's top local story this hour. Salt Lake City Police say they've seen a reduction in violent crime over the past year. KSL News Radio's Amy Kobe reports. Down 11% for all crimes, according to Chief Mike Brown. He says this is because of the hard work of their officers. Many major cities saw a sharp rise in crime like homicides in recent years. The number of homicides stayed the same in Salt Lake City last year as the year before at 16. But Chief Brown says none of the homicide cases from last year remain unsolved. Our top national story this hour from ABC News. A record-breaking storm dumping rain and wind on Southern California, still battering that region, and it will last until late Tuesday. But ABC's Alex Stone in Los Angeles says conditions have improved today. The rain is much lighter today compared to Sunday when it was just pouring for many hours. Forecasters say the heavy rain is coming back, but this has been a bit of a break today. It is still coming down. There are still some small mudslide problems, some flooding here and there. But kids went back to school, and this lighter rain is helping out. Your money at this moment, the Dow Jones average uh, down on the day now 197 points, while the NASDAQ is down just 23 points. And our KSL weather, we are getting some rain here in Utah as well. Not as heavy, but uh, it's coming. That's next. KSL News Time 131. Here's a way to get breaking news updates anywhere you go. At the store or in a work meeting, you can get breaking news on your phone. You can quickly read it, swipe, or click for more. It's super discreet, super fast. That's the app for KSL News Radio. If you want to get rolling in the new year with your financial services, go to Hercules First Federal Credit Union. Our friends at uh, Hercules are always there for you. They've been doing this since 1946, and they get it. So whether you need a mortgage, Uh, They have competitive rates. They can give you conventional or government loans. Uh, They can match uh, any uh, rate or fees out there in the marketplace. Most important, they're going to give you a stress-free experience that's going to give you confidence in your financial future. Uh, They also have their uh, Hercules Gold Tier checking account for you. It's it's their way of saying thanks. Uh, They give you the ultimate in ID, uh, identity theft protection, cellular care coverage, travel services, and so much more. With our friends at Hercules First Federal Credit Union, you can find their branches at Taylorsville, Harriman, Riverton, or Salt Lake City, or you can always just find them online, which I love. You can find them online at HerculesCU.com. That's HerculesCU.com. Valentine's Day is here. This year, give the ultimate gift. Name a star after your sweetheart. This is Rocky Moselle with International Star Registry. For 45 years, we've named millions of stars for celebrities, dignitaries, and individuals worldwide. For $59 and a call to 800-282-3333 or visit starregistry.com, you can give the most memorable gift. The star you name will be recorded in book form in the U.S. Copyright Office. Visit starregistry.com or call 800-282-3333. Valentine's Day is here. This year, give the ultimate gift. Name a star after your sweetheart. This is Rocky Moselle with International Star Registry. For 45 years, we've named millions of stars for celebrities, dignitaries, and individuals worldwide. For $59 and a call to 800-282-3333 or visit starregistry.com, you can give the most memorable gift. The star you name will be recorded in book form in the U.S. Copyright Office. Visit starregistry.com or call 800-282-3333. We're looking at emergency traffic now, brought to you by Sinclair's Dino Pay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meese. Traffic on northbound I-15 in Davis County coming to a crawl. Don't really know what's happening, but essentially from about 5th West Bountiful all the way up to Glover Lane Farmington, we had UHP maybe doing a slowdown or holding traffic back in Centerville by Parish Lane, but this delay stretches from Bountiful 
into Farmington. Uh, you are going to be moving. You are just not going to be moving fast. Again, don't forget we have a right lanes blocked eastbound 90 is south just by Monroe Street due to a downed power line. Salt Lake Magazine calls Swan Lake breathtaking, featuring the timeless music of Tchaikovsky, performed live with the Ballet West Orchestra. February 9th through the 17th, buy tickets at balletwest.org. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. KSL weather the showers come back today continue the next several days and we'll also get some additional snow in the mountains right now 46 degrees and cloudy at uh, ksl news radio i'm dan bonnes from the ksl common spirit health studios listen online at kslnewsradio.com or utah's news traffic and weather station Inside Sources. Inside Inside Sources. America's Voice of Reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Sometimes when we attempt to fix one problem, we end up creating others. And sometimes uh, we have to step back and say, wait a minute, what have we actually done? Uh, What is the actual desired result that we're trying to get to? Of course, after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, as it was known back in 2010, uh, supporters touted uh, that it was a big step forward in terms of the American health care system, what could be achieved. And while there have definitely been some things that have been done much better, there's also some things that have gotten much worse. And so often that has to do with big uh, and monopolies in particular is where we get into trouble. Uh, Really uh, grateful to have on the program today Matt Stoller, Director of Research at the American Economic Liberties Project. He's also the author of the book Goliath, The Hundred-Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. And Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, I I love the way that you kind of broke this down because, again, regardless of what people think the right solution is, it's important that we're able to construct and deconstruct what we actually do, look at the results and say, okay, how do we do it different uh, and so we'll start uh, with just a little backstory in terms of uh, you had a great piece talking about this in terms of what happened coming out of the Affordable Care Act and some of the problems that it created as a result. Yeah, so the gist of the reform that, um, you know, that we undertook in 2010 and also a, a kind of similar reform in 2003 on prescription drugs, one of which was uh, the Obamacare was a Democratic initiative and Republic, the 2003 uh, Part D um, prescription drug spending for Medicare was a Republican initiative. But the idea behind both of them is you want to expand access to health care, right? So there's a bunch of people that can't get access. They don't have either health care insurance or they don't have access to prescription drugs. So let's put more public money into actually getting them access to the system. And once they have access to the system, they will get healthier. That's the premise of, of all of it. But by and large, when the, um, our policymakers actually thought about what to do, they didn't think about the delivery model on the back end, right? So who owns the hospitals and who owns the, you know, the urgent care clinics and the pharmaceutical firms and the pharmaceutical benefit managers and and insurance companies and so on and so forth who deliver the care, they didn't really, they didn't, that wasn't a, a significant concern. So what ended up happening is um, huge amounts of consolidation on the back end, a lot more public money getting dumped in on the front end. And while uh, people had more health care insurance, after, particularly after Obamacare, um, they actually didn't necessarily get better care. Their, um, you know, utilization rates, uh, didn't uh, it, 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 we, we have we have fewer doctors in this country per capita than lots of other countries? We have a lot less um, care delivered than a lot of other countries, and we spend a lot more than uh, than a lot of other countries. So there's more access to this intermediate financial product we call health care insurance, but there's actually less access to to care because we didn't think about um, the consolidation on the provider side who actually delivers the care. I don't yeah. know if that makes sense. Yeah, but that's legitimate. absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's such a great example of saying, okay, here, here's what we want, but then what do we really want? And the result, of course, is we want better health <laughs> uh, and better care. 
uh, be ultimately being delivered. Uh, and I think that's one of the uh, the crucial things that we have to always come back to is what what is the desired result? And is this producing the desired result? And if not, why not? So that we can actually have a real debate and discussion about uh, how to actually get there. Uh, one of the things that you have pointed out that I think is uh, is important for all of us to think through, not just when it comes to healthcare. There's a whole host of issues we should get to on this. Is that sometimes you got to break stuff uh, in order to fix stuff, and, and sometimes I feel like we end up just patchworking uh, through the political process things that uh, really don't change the dynamic. They they may give us a short term feel good. Uh, but in the end, uh, don't do a whole lot to either break what needs to be completely broken uh, or to build something new. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of, I mean, look, we spend something like 4 or $5 trillion a year on health care, and probably half of that is waste, bloat, excess profit, that kind yeah. of thing. And, like, you know, look, a little bit of waste is not that big a deal, but a lot of waste becomes a whole economy, right? Yeah. If you were to fix quote unquote, fix it. Two trillion dollars is a lot of jobs. It's a lot of people who are engaged in, you know, like about a third, something like a third of the spending or a fourth of the spending that a hospital undertakes is on just billing, figuring out yeah. how to like account for who to ask money from. And it's like, if you've ever dealt with a hospital, I mean, you think big government is bad, like try to get, a, you know, anything from a hospital system. It's, it's just like a nightmare. Um, that's all waste, right? But people are are doing jobs. Like there's a lot of just kind of busy work in that we call healthcare, um, and it's because you know we have uh, we have a whole like kind of in the 1970s, 1980s, people started thinking about healthcare as a as a financial business. They started saying, okay, well, as opposed to like thinking about it as like okay, a doctor and a patient need to see each other. The doctor should deliver care, and the doctor has certain obligations. Uh, we started to say, okay, well, how do we put a lot of money into the system and then create incentives from kind of distant technocrats to make the doctor and make the patient do the right thing? And we have kind of keep tweaking those, those levers, um, and we've tweaked them for 40, 50 years at this point, instead of just saying, well, maybe the doctor – should be in kind of control of the situation and we should find a financing model that lets them do that as opposed to like, you know, all of the kind of busy work that everyone now has to jump through to make sure that nothing is wasted, which in fact is, you know, that busy work is the waste. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to quote you on that for a very long time, because <laughs> because sometimes that uh, in our effort to prevent waste, uh, that wasted opportunity, that wasted busy work uh, and the endless hoops that the ultimate consumer, the patients have to jump through. Uh, there's actually a waste factor there as well. It's, it's sort of a time tax for a, a, a lot of people who can't afford it, but they get so frustrated in the process they end up giving up, you know, trying to get that claim uh, resolved or getting that reimbursement back. Uh, and so as you look at it. Right. It's like it's like oh, you get you get sick and you're like, congratulations, here's a second job managing your health care bill. <laughs> yeah, ex yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what I need when I'm sick. Yeah. It's like I need to manage. I love homework. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I need is a little more homework and to be on hold uh, trying to get something resolved for a while. And often I will confess, Man, well, and, and uh, this is always a problem at my house, it's like, okay, it's this amount of money, I, it's not worth my time. And so you just give up and you just move on. Well, see, I just love being on hold. Yeah. Like for me, I love the healthcare system. I you look busy. <laughs> yeah. It's just so good, man. Uh, press, press pound if, oh, my God. You know. Yeah, for the 17th time, <laughs> and you'll start over. Uh, hey, last, yeah. last minute, uh, give me one thing that you wish we were talking about or talking differently about uh, when it comes to how do we fix this? Okay, so the the answer is pretty simple um, conceptually, right? So right now, United Health Group, it's a uh, three hundred billion dollars of revenue a year. It's a kind of a quasi public enterprise. Most of the money that it makes comes from Medicare Advantage, so it's coming from taxpayer money. They are the biggest in, biggest insurer in health insurer in the country. They're also the biggest employer of physicians, so they take money as an insurer where they're supposed to pay for stuff, and then they pay it to themselves because they own these physician practices. They also sell software. They own a bunch of other stuff. And there's a conflict of interest there. You shouldn't take other people's money, which is what an insurance company handles, and give it to yourself, right? right? It's very basic. So separate them out and say, okay, you can be an insurer, so you can take other people's money and manage it, or you can 
uh, sell to that payer, right? Mm-hmm. You can be a doctor's practices yeah. and software stuff. So it's sort of like we used to have this law in the, in the Wall Street area called Glass-Steagall, which separated out investment banks from commercial banks, very similar dynamic. Yeah. Um, the users of money from the um, – from the, the the lenders of money, and um, and uh, you, you just kind of need to manage the conflict of interest by through structural separation. We did that yeah. with railroads. We did it with TV. We did it like you know instead of trying to what we do now, and I think both parties are complicit in this, is we try to like come up with like a super complicated regulatory scheme where we we try to micromanage everything. Right. And of course, it doesn't work, and it's a pain. It's like <laughs> it so makes it, annoying. Yeah, it makes and it just, worse in just, the just, end. Hey, Matt, yeah, we're going to separate we're, it out. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Separate it out. That's the key. Matt Stoller, uh, thanks so much for joining us. A great perspective. We'll have you back because this is a conversation we have to stay with. We'll be right back. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial grade supplies for every industry with same day pickup and next day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help so you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. On job sites, few things are more important than a solid work boot. At Boot Barn Work, we pride ourselves on knowing that no matter your trade, when there's hard work to be done, your boot should be built for nonstop protection and mobility. Thoroughgood checks all the boxes. Their wear anywhere boots are time tested and crafted with the highest quality materials for relentless support. For job fitted boots, Thoroughgood at Boot Barn Work. Believe it or not, most small businesses don't have a 401k. If you don't have a 401k, you are missing out on the greatest wealth creation tool ever created. I'm Jeff Jr. with Trajan Wealth, and many 401ks are overpriced for the employer, have expensive and underperforming investment options, and have tedious administrative provisions. Not at Trajan Wealth. We can set up a 401k for a company for only 8 bucks per employee, a $65 per plan fee, plus a small advisory fee. That's right, not thousands or even the tens of thousands you've been quoted and do it all in less time than it takes to sit in traffic if you have five or more employees these 401ks will help you attract and retain top talent and if you're an employee and don't have a 401k tell your boss call trajan wealth today call 801-899-7600 that's 801-899-7600 services offered through a third-party partner. tim jr here from rgs exteriors And did you know that we get a bunch of service calls per year from people who didn't even hire us? That means they originally hired someone else to replace their siding, gutters, and windows. Then later, when a problem popped up, they tried to call their contractor back to fix it, only to find out that the contractor has ceased to exist. They're gone, done, out of business. At RGS Exteriors, we've been serving Utah for 70 years. As a fifth generation owned contractor, we've got customers who are the grandkids of our customers we had in the 1950s and 60s. We're not going anywhere. We will be here when you need us, period. For siding, gutters, and windows, now and forever, call RGS Exteriors at 801-280-3110 or visit at rgsexteriors.com. That's 801-280-3110 or rgsexteriors.com. Getting help with electrical repairs is easier than you think. All you have to do is call Any Hour Services or schedule an appointment at anyhourservices.com. No one helps more homeowners than Any Hour Services. KSL Broadcast Group contests are open to participants 13 years of age and older that are residents of Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, and Nevada, unless otherwise specified. Employees or agents of the station, Bonneville International Corporation, or other area radio stations, or any entity associated with the contest may not enter. Persons who have won in the last 90 days from a station contest or event are not eligible. Full general contest rules are available at kslnewsradio.com. Two friends taking pictures of the rising full moon on a summer night. Two teenage kids doing what teenage kids do. When a stranger with a gun and a death wish changed everything. It was violent, it was senseless, and I will never understand it, I will never accept it. I'm Amy Donaldson, and unfortunately, 
we're all too familiar with stories about how violence shatters lives. But what we rarely see is how they are rebuilt. In a new podcast, The Letter, we relive tragedy, but only so we can hear the rest of the story, the struggle to reclaim lives, the realities of grief, and the possibilities of forgiveness. I believe in miracles. Sometimes I thought, there are no miracles. Yeah, there are, and this is a big one. Follow the letter at theletterpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bonas. First, crime in Salt Lake City has dropped by 11% over the past year. Second, a local internet provider says their most common scam is one that should be easy to spot. And third, Southern California is still getting rain, but not as heavy as it was during the weekend. Right now, 46 degrees and cloudy in Salt Lake City. Back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Hear elevated conversation on crucial issues. Boyd Matheson on Inside Sources. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today. As always, I am Boyd Matheson. We are returning to the border conversation to finish off hour number one of Inside Sources. Uh, between the topsy turvy, opposite day kind of feel we've had where we've had Republicans yelling against things they've always been for and the president yelling that he's for things that he's always been against. Uh, it sounds like a lot of politics to me, and whenever we get lost in the politics of it all, we forget that there's actually some real good policy discussions that could be had in there uh, and often get overlooked. And so when we get in the middle of that kind of muddle, uh, we always turn to Eric Baim, a reporter at Reason. Reason.com covers economic policy, trade policy, and elections. Always helps us make the news make sense. Uh, and Eric, you have a great piece today that everybody should check out at Reason.com. Uh, talking about how increasing immigration could actually help us with another big problem we talk about on this show, reducing the debt and <laughs> deficit spending. Wait a minute. That sounds like uh, crazy talk. Yeah, boy, thanks for having me, as always. Um, yeah, I think I actually, of the two kind of intractable problems in Washington, which are, you know, immigration and uh, spending, I actually think the spending issue is maybe the easier one to solve, which is, you know, it's still not easy, uh, but uh, certainly seems like one that, you know, there, there are at least uh, ideas out there that can help reduce the deficit. And one of them, you know, ironically enough, is, is increasing immigration. So the piece that I wrote for Reason looks at how uh, it, uh, this is a bit of a wonky topic, obviously, but uh, it looks at how the uh, Congressional Budget Office kind of does a poor job of calculating the economic benefits mm. of immigration, um, and that's just because of some rules that the CBO uses when it when it scores legislation. Um, but uh, the complicating thing here is that you know because it because it does a poor job of looking at the economic benefits that actually makes it harder to pass mm. immigration bills yeah. uh, because it ends up you know scoring bills as being you know perhaps more negative towards the deficit than they otherwise would be uh, I, you know, I don't think that's the biggest obstacle to passing an immigration bill by any means, as we've certainly seen today uh, in Washington. But, uh, but it's a factor, and I think it's one of those things that lawmakers, you know, should probably adjust uh, if they ever want to make a good faith effort at solving the immigration problem, which, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty skeptical they actually do, but yeah, that's where we are. Exactly. It is the uh, it's the politics of it all. Uh, I'm, I'm still convinced we could solve it in an afternoon if uh, we just put it on the floor of the House and the Senate. Everybody seems to agree uh, yep. on, on the policy pieces. Uh, now, you may have called it wonky. We just call it enlightened. Uh, it's great thinking, as uh, <laughs> we like to call it on this show. Uh, but I want to dig into it. I want to. I want you to unpack it for us just a little bit, because, again, most people think, uh oh, if we have more immigration, that's bad. That's costing us money. That's hurting the economy. Uh, and so just kind of walk us through what it is uh, that we should be just tweaking and recognizing uh, of how this one problem that we seem not to be able to solve could actually help us solve another problem that we seem to not be able to solve. Sure. Yeah. So the, this uh, the, the piece that I wrote uh, specifically looks at a study that was done by the Penn Wharton budget model. This is a, a CB. It's sort of like a shadow CBO, if you will. It's a think tank that basically does the same sort of work that the CBO does, uh, except it's housed at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and so it's you know independent. It's outside of Congress. But they do the same sort of analysis they, and they look at the same sorts of things. Um, and uh, the report that they put out last month actually went back and looked at a, uh, a provision 
that was in the America Competes Act. This was the a Democrat proposed uh, piece of legislation from about a year ago. It was a, a kind of an omnibus bill that did a bunch of different things. One of the proposals in there, though, uh, had to do with immigration, and it had to do with uh, increasing specifically uh, green cards for high-skilled immigrants, so uh, people who have uh, PhDs or, or other advanced degrees in STEM fields, in science and technology fields. And uh, what the Penn Wharton budget model found is that if you increase, uh, basically remove the caps for uh, green cards for those individuals, you would end up uh, generating a tremendous amount of new tax revenue for the country, hundreds of billions of dollars over 10 years of new tax revenue. And if, if you think about it, this just sort of makes sense, right? You would have a, a larger number of high-skilled immigrants coming into the United States who would be working uh, legally, presumably at pretty high-paying jobs, and therefore paying taxes and not, not consuming welfare, not consuming a lot of government benefits. And so that's a net win for the, from the government's perspective. That's certainly a net win for the budget. That means you've got a lot of tax revenue coming in, more tax revenue coming in for more high-skilled, high-earning workers. Um, and uh, that would be, a, again, a couple hundred billion dollars over 10 years that would help reduce the deficit. When the CBO scored that same piece of legislation, they actually said it would be a $4 billion hit to the deficit. That's mm. basically zero, right? Over 10 right. years, $4 billion is nothing in the federal, in the federal budget. But they, they failed to recognize the potential benefits there, and that is entirely because of the way the CBO looks at legislation. It doesn't take into account potential economic growth. It doesn't take into account the potential tax revenue that comes from that economic growth. And so the CBO is only looking at the costs, uh, which in this case would be pretty marginal, mm. uh, but they're only looking at the fact that, well, if you increase immigration, you increase the population of the country, and then you're going to marginally increase the cost of some government programs, like like some health care programs. Yeah. Um, so the CBO just you know, it has a blind spot here, basically. Yeah. Uh, you pointed out in your piece that uh, if, if you go down this path, you play it out, uh, that more of that legal immigration uh, will grow the economy, will help fund the government, as you pointed out. Sure. And it doesn't put a strain. It does not put a strain on entitlement and welfare programs uh, because of the way that goes out. And so uh, as you look at that, uh, Eric, what is it that uh, – I mean, good inspiration comes from good information. It's clear that Congress doesn't have the right information coming from, from the CBO score – uh, how do we change that dynamic, and can that help us get to a better conversation when it comes to immigration? Yeah, so two answers, I think, to that. First is that acutely Congress should just tell the CBO to score immigration bills differently, to use something called dynamic scoring, uh, which is what they use for things like tax bills. If, right. you, if you remember the debate over the Trump tax cuts a few years ago, lots of debates over whether that was going to add to the deficit or not, and that all hinged on the different ways that you could score this bill. So that's the wonky answer is that Congress should just tell the CBO to use a more advanced more sophisticated and, frankly, better way of, of scoring immigration bills. Uh, the less acute point and the more general point is that, uh, look, this is true, obviously. I think it's obviously and very apparently true for high-skilled, high-earning immigrants, right? But I think the same sort of dynamic exists for immigration across the board. If you increase legal immigration, if you make it easier for people to come here through legal channels to you know, become green card holders, to eventually become citizens, uh, to pay taxes, to work, you know, legal jobs where everything is above board. Uh, that's going to be a win for the, it's going to be a win for the economy, obviously, but it's also going to be a win for the government and for reducing the deficit because it means people will be paying taxes. They'll be contributing uh, to Social Security and other programs like that. Uh, and they'll be able to do all that because they're legal immigrants. So that gets rid of the problem, which really is a uh, you know the the fact that we have you know illegal immigrants coming here, people who are coming here through uh, channels that are that are not the legal channels because it is so difficult. It's borderline mm -hmm. impossible to come here sometimes through uh, the legal channels. Yeah. So uh, you know it's it's a win obviously for the people involved, which I think is the most important part of the story. But it's a win for the economy and it's and it's potentially a big win for the federal budget deficit too, which is. Uh, you know, a growing concern. All right. And I'm starting my Eric Bain for president campaign uh, on air right now. <laughs> Eric has the best at definition. That's exactly what the conversation well, should be. Please do not wish that upon me, boy. No, <laughs> That's right. We're please, actually, we're friends. Please do not. We are friends, so I will not wish that on you. Uh, Eric Bain, reporter mm -hmm. at Reason, uh, and always helps us get it straight. And this is a great example, folks, of what it's like to have a different kind of conversation, to take just the pure politics out of it and say, what are the principles 
What are the policies? What are the desired results? Eric, as always, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot, Boyd. Uh, again, that's Eric Bame. I will not wish the presidency on Eric, uh, but he is a great thinker and a great writer. You can check out his work at Reason.com. And uh, again, on a day like today where everyone is yelling and screaming about things they're for or and against uh, when it comes to the border, uh, border security and immigration, and most of it is a lot of political nonsense. People yelling about things and against things they've been for, people yelling for things they've always been against, all for the pure politics of it. Eric just walked you through why we do this show, to get to the principles, to the policies that will produce the right results. All right, that wraps up hour number one of Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. We'll step aside for some top of the hour news. Don't go anywhere, though. We're going to attack higher education that also has a few broken places coming up next. Stick around. KSL FM Midvale. KSL Salt Lake City. From the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. This is KSL News Radio. Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. It's 2 o'clock at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bonas. KSL's top story this hour Governor Spencer Cox went to the U.S. Mexico border over the weekend, and KSL TV's Shelby Lofton has more on that visit. Governor Cox said the situation at the border is something Utahns should care about. He said he believes Utah is welcoming to immigrants and refugees. There are lots of false narratives around here that if you care about border security, that means you hate immigrants or refugees. That is not true. And Governor Cox says there may not be a place for migrants to stay when they reach the United States. And the border crisis is also making it easier for drugs to make it into Utah. Several places on the Internet claim tomorrow is Safer Internet Day. So what scam does ex-Mission founder and CEO Pete Ashdown hear about most from his clients? The big one for us is please click here to reset your email password or we're testing a new email system. Go to this web page and there are always scams. We never ask people to reset their password unless they're talking to us on the phone. Ashdown says people don't need to worry about Bluetooth hacking, though, because it's mostly limited to music. Our top national story this hour from ABC News. Britain's King Charles III has been diagnosed with cancer. He's being advised to postpone his public-facing duties. The cancer was discovered while the king was hospitalized for a benign prostate issue. But Buckingham Palace hasn't said just what kind of cancer it is. The king is 75 years old. Your money at this moment, the uh, Dow Jones average uh, down on the day now, 274 points. Uh, The Nasdaq down 31 points as we approach the close of trading. And our KSL weather looks like uh, the rain will continue here in Utah. That's next. KSL News Time 201. News doesn't just mean information or dates. It's the story of our local history being told in real time. Be a part of the story. This is Tim Hughes and Amanda Dixon. We hope to be a part of your story. We have you covered on KSL News Radio. Hey, folks, it's Doug and Kathy with Window World. Doug, can you believe it's been 20 years? What's been 20 years? Well, since we opened our first Window World store. (laughs) That is amazing. Our motto today is the same. Quality products, professionally installed, backed up by our awesome warranty. And our team shares those very same values. Come see us today. We have stores in Murray and Spanish Fork for your convenience. Experience the Window World difference. Call 801-281-8111 or visit windowworldutah.com. And we promise no baloney. Okay. Hey, that's good. Whoa, whoa, Dave! Sorry, I'll go grab some paper towels. You can't let Dave pour things. He works at JCW's. They fill stuff up past the brim over there, like their milkshakes. They're thick, rich, and oh my gosh. Delicious. Oh no. Dave's filling up Crystal's car for her. Dave, stop. Hey, this is Clark for JCW. Stop into any of our five locations today. We're located in American Fork, Thanksgiving Point, Provo, South Jordan, and our new location in Harriman. Come in and see why at JCW we believe in quality and a lot of it. Many people, Amanda, I think, start each new year with uh, one of two resolutions. One is to lose weight. 
The other is to save money. Yeah. And if you struggle to do that in the past, UCCU has an automatic way to help you. I have used these wonderful savings goals, savings accounts at UCCU so many times. In fact, I just set one up. It's so easy. You just go and you tell, what are you saving for? So right now I'm saving for a senior trip for my youngest son. Mm -hmm. And I tell her, I have until June of 2025. I want to save this much money. And then it will tell you, all right, well, then every month or every other week or whatever you want to do, you have to set aside this much and it will automatically take it out of your savings account. You can have as many accounts as you want, name them whatever you want. And let's just say you want to save 600 bucks this year. Right. 50 bucks a month will automatically go in and you're reaching your goals. You haven't done a thing. This is the way to save money and not feel it, which is a way to be successful. So to get started, just log in to their online or mobile banking and click on any of the goals to begin. UCCU.com. Utah Community Credit Union. Love where you bank. Common Spirit Health. Hospitals, clinics, and caregivers all connected to advance health care in Colorado, Kansas, and Utah. Health care with human kindness is here. Hello, human kindness. Traffic and weather together brought to you by Sinclair's DinoPay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meese. I am seeing some delays southbound I-15 in Weber County going from 5600 South Roy down to about 2300 North in the Sunset area. Also, don't forget, we still have a right lane block due to debris on the road eastbound 90th South by Monroe Street. For a limited time, open a nine-month certificate from Cypress Credit Union and get five point six percent APY. Learn more at any branch or visit cypresscu.com. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. KSL weather. The showers come back today and continue over the next several days. We'll also get additional snow in the mountains. And right now, 45 degrees with a rain shower at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bomas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com. For Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside Sources. America's voice of reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. When it comes to higher education, it's been under the microscope and a very hot topic of late. Many people are saying that the system is broken, but we seem to be yelling about all the wrong things. How do we get to the right discussion about what an American university should be, could be, and what it's supposed to do for those that it strives to serve? Let's begin. Think you know the news of the day? Think again with Boyd Matheson on KSL News Radio. Well, if you've been tracking the news at all of late, uh, the American university system, higher education, uh, has really been in the hot seat, to be sure. You've had uh, congressional hearings. You've had state governments uh, yelling at things. You've had uh, donors and boosters pulling funds for different reasons. Uh, And we seem to be shouting at a lot of the wrong things. And I think it's time to have a think again moment in terms of what is really broken and how can we actually fix it to serve the needs of the people. Uh, Someone who's uh, taken a big swing at that, Ian Bogos, uh, contributing writer at The Atlantic, uh, had a piece in The Atlantic, uh, getting to the heart of this. What's the real problem with American universities? And uh, Ian joins us on the program. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, So give me a little uh, uh, essence in terms of this conversation. A lot of things that we can shout about in terms of culture wars and DEI and all of the other things. Uh, You you acknowledge all of that, and then you move just way past it in terms of a different kind of conversation. Give us kind of the essence in terms of what should we actually be thinking about when it comes to what it should be doing, and uh, how do we actually fix it? Yes, yeah, so I talked to a, a former college president, and Brian Rosenberg, who has a, has a book out on this subject now. And for him, the key issue is that college is too expensive and not enough people graduate. Those are the things to fix. But they're really hard to fix because making changes in American universities is very difficult because of kind of the way they're structured and operate. Yeah, and as you look at how they uh, how they operate, one of the things that that you pointed out that I thought was really fascinating uh, in your conversation with Brian Rosenberg uh, was how uh, the expertise itself often erodes collaboration, uh, and that kind of undermines yeah. the whole process. Explain that for us. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so interesting. I work at a university, too, and it's hard to explain this sometimes to people outside of these institutions. So you have a bunch of really talented uh, researchers and teachers who know a lot about a specific subject very deeply. 
and they're almost like uh, free agents in, in a way. And uh, Rosenberg calls it like a university, like a uh, like an all-star team. You got all these great people together, but they don't really work together as a team because they're focused on their individual areas of expertise, biology, mechanical engineering, literature, whatever, rather than on kind of coming together uh, to form a team in order to accomplish a goal. Yeah, and so as, uh, as you look at how we start breaking that down or, or how we should be having the conversation, uh, give us some con- some context from, from that conversation. <laughs> right, it's, it's just, and this is really hard to do because, you know, one of the things that Rosenberg's saying is that uh, the kind of change that you need in order, for example, to, to get better access uh, uh, to universities, um, to get more people through, especially uh, folks from their backgrounds, you know, uh, underrepresented minorities, uh, um, uh, uh, less, you know, folks are not going to go to Harvard or, or Princeton uh, or whatever, uh, you have to change something about the structure of the institutions uh, themselves, uh, who they admit, how they get people through, uh, where the focus on, on education lives, and, and having a focus on education, for example, instead of on research and education together. So one of the problems um, that Brian Rosenberg identifies is that it's just really hard to change these institutions because they're kind of designed to resist change. They're designed to be the same and, uh, and to last you know, for hundreds of years. They've been spectacularly successful at that, but less successful at changing. Yeah, and I think that's uh, – I love in your piece uh, you talked about the fact that uh, changing it, which is what a lot of people are calling for, would would change it, <laughs> and that's that's sort of that gravity of that. Uh, I think is a is a hard part that we've got to figure out how to navigate. Yeah, it, it's uh, you know what has to happen in order to make change is either that you have to get everybody together because you know what one of the things is that um, university professors, university faculty, uh, have a large role in the way that these organizations run. It's, it's called shared governance, which is an insider term. Um, and that means that it's easy to say no to things. Uh, sometimes things that need to happen for the greater good, um, but that don't benefit you as an individual, as an individual scholar researcher, uh, because they, you know, they represent a, a change uh, to the. And you know, it's a very conservative profession. There's great things about that, but one of the downsides is this: that it's kind of hard to turn the ship. Yeah, it's definitely uh, definitely hard to turn, and especially in the midst of of real challenging times. Uh, and uh, you mentioned in your piece a lot of the, the culture issues, the wokeness, the DEI, the academic freedom, anti-Semitism. You, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, and a lot of yeah, times it's yeah. failing because it's not getting to the, the real issue in terms of what you started with, which is too expensive and uh, beyond the elites. Uh, it, it's just not working for, for the rest of them. Right, right. Yeah, one, of the, one, of the, one of the positions that Rosenberg takes on this is that um, the political issue, what we might collectively call the political issues, universities are kind of a, a luxury matter. Like if you're Harvard, then you can worry about those things. And you sort of have to in order to distinguish yourself because there's so much money, so many resources, so many people want to be there, do all the things that they do. Uh, but for most people who are uh, struggling to get through college, to get into college, to, to, to you know, find their path in the future, uh, in, their, um, in their personal lives, in their careers, those issues are just not relevant. And so they're, um, they're just serving this kind of culture war discourse rather than helping actual Americans uh, get a degree uh, and then move on to the rest of their lives. Yeah, so important. This is a, a crucial conversation that we've got to get to, and we've got to get at it differently. Ian Bogos, contributing writer at The Atlantic. Great piece, great thinking, and a great conversation between you and Mr. Rosenberg uh, that I think gets us to a different space uh, to help us actually think again about what we think we know about the higher education. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you. Uh, again, that was Ian Bogos, a contributing writer at The Atlantic. And in his piece in The Atlantic, uh, there's so many great analogies in terms of where we're focusing on all the wrong things in all the wrong places and, and how we have to get back to what is it that we actually need this to do. And One of the things uh, that Ian points out in his piece is that if we think and we want the next hundred years uh, to play out the same way the last hundred years played out, then higher education is probably doing its job because uh, it's sort of that status quo of this is what we do, this is what we deliver, this is how it works, this is what comes out the other end. It's kind of a, a system. But if we believe that the future is going to be very dynamic, that the next 100 years has to be vastly different in terms of what students are going to need to move out into the real world and thrive and succeed and contribute to society, 
then we got to figure out a different model and a different way. I think we have some great things happening here in the state of Utah in terms of being creative, in terms of what this means, what this looks like, how we can alter the status quo of time in seats and people in classes. I mean, I get it. Back in the 1700s, in order for education to happen, you had to have people, you had to have teachers, you had to have books all in the same place at the same time in order for learning to happen. We live in a very different world, and the future is going to be even more different. And so it's time to rethink what we think we know about higher education. It's time to be disruptive and challenge the status quo. And it's time for a bigger vision of what we want higher education to be and what it will actually deliver for our children, our grandchildren, and the future of the country. We'll be right back. Think again on Inside Sources with Boyd Matheson. The last thing you want in the morning is more noise. The day's just getting started. Maybe you're feeling a little anxious or overwhelmed, and it's not even eight yet. So catching up on important news stories, some sense of weather and traffic, it shouldn't be stressful. Get a wrap on the day ahead from smart, inviting voices who know you're trying to ease in. Do you love a rainy day? I do, actually. I do, too. Tim and Amanda, mornings from 5 to 9. They have you covered on KSL News Radio. Hi, this is Doug Ride, and we all loved and grew up with the game. Now you're going to love the show. It's on the stage at Hale Center Theater right now, and it's called Clue. It is so funny, so clever, and I've got to tell you this. I love plays that include slow motion scenes. I'm not kidding you. And even rewind scenes. And if you're looking for the best death scene ever, ever witnessed on the stage, it's waiting for you right now at Hale Center Theater in Clue. But there's so much more coming up in the 2024 season. And that includes Fiddler on the Roof. That's coming up next. Sound of Music. May We All, a country musical, The Time Machine, The Nutty Professor, Aladdin, The Magician's Elephant, and Beauty and the Beast. It's going to be a great season at Hale Center Theater. Go to hct.org to get your season tickets, individual tickets, and, of course, gift cards. Hey, I'm Andy. If you don't know me, it's probably because I'm not famous. But I did start a men's grooming company called Harry's. The idea for Harry's came out of a frustrating experience I had buying razor blades. Most brands were overpriced, overdesigned, and out of touch. At Harry's, our approach is simple. Here's our secret. We make sharp, durable blades and sell them at honest prices for as low as $2 each. We care about quality so much that we do some crazy things, like buy a world-class German blade factory. Millions of guys have already made the switch to Harry's, so thank you if you're one of them. And if you're not, we hope you give us a try soon. Harry's is available online and in-store at a retailer near you. Get a $13 trial set for just 3 bucks at harrys.com slash news. That's harrys.com slash news. Or check us out at your local Costco for a price you can't find anywhere else. Just look for the Chrome Razor with 13-blade refills at your local Costco. You can't miss it. Exclusive to Costco members. Alpine Home Medical, we bring wellness home. Do you ever feel like getting your supplies for your CPAP is just a huge headache? Hi, I'm Jay Broadbent with Alpine Home Medical. We'll say goodbye to the hassle and hello to a stress-free life with our CPAP resupply service. Signing up is a breeze. Just place a call, choose your products, and leave the insurance billing and shipping to us. Our discreet packaging prioritizes your privacy, and we always ensure an on-time delivery. No more trips to the store or worrying about running out of important supplies. We get how crucial your CPAP therapy is, so don't let the stress of keeping up with it affect your sleep and health. Join Alpine Resupply resupply today and enjoy a tranquil night's sleep with all your CPAP essentials. Visit us at alpinehomemedical.com. Alpine Home Medical, we bring wellness home. That's alpinehomemedical.com. Any Hour Services can help you make sure your furnace keeps you warm this winter. Whether you need a tune-up, a repair, or a second opinion about replacing it, call Any Hour Services or visit anyhourservices.com. At Social Security, we are always thinking of ways to save you time and make things easier. That's why we created My Social Security. Opening a My Social Security account gives you secure access to your personal record and interactive tools tailored for you. 
You can see if you are eligible to receive benefits, view spousal benefit estimates, and compare retirement benefit estimates at different ages or dates when you want to start receiving benefits. Already receiving benefits? Use your account to change your address, set up or change direct deposit, get a proof of income letter, and more. In most states, you can also request a replacement Social Security card. Save time. Go online. Open a My Social Security account at ssa.gov slash myaccount. Social Security. Securing today and tomorrow. Produced at U.S. taxpayer expense. I'm Dave Cauley, investigative journalist and host of the podcast, Cold. Don't miss Cold's new season three, where I look into the unsolved disappearance of Cherie Warren, a woman last seen leaving her job at a Salt Lake City office in 1985. Police cast suspicion on Cherie's estranged husband and boyfriend, but never made any arrests or recovered Cherie's remains. Find Cold Season 3, The Search for Cherie, anywhere you get your podcasts. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bonas. First, seems the most common internet scam on one local provider is something users should be able to avoid pretty easily. Second, Governor Cox isn't happy with what he saw on his visit to the U.S. southern border. Third, Britain's King Charles dealing with a cancer diagnosis after his recent visit to the hospital. And right now, 45 degrees with rain showers in Salt Lake City. Back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Get deeper insights on the news from Inside Sources. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today. As always, I am Boyd Matheson, and we're going to spend the next two segments of the show talking about the Middle East. And we're going to do it in two ways. One, we're going to give you a quick update in terms of what is going on in the region. Obviously, as things continue to escalate, we still have challenges in Israel and Gaza. Uh, We have the U.S. retaliation uh, for the attack that tragically killed three U.S. soldiers, wounded over 40 others. Uh, We'll break all that down in this segment. And then we're going to step back a little bit. And we're going to do a little bit of a historical perspective in terms of how we got where we are, what the dynamics in the region are, and what we should really be watching for as this all moves forward. So we'll be joined uh, by James Gelvin coming up at 2.35 uh, for that part of the perspective. But let's begin with the present reality. Where are we right now? Uh, Beginning this past Friday and over the weekend, the U.S. military carried out over 85 attacks and airstrikes in several countries in the Middle East. Uh, This was part one of what President Biden has uh, referred to as a retaliatory operation in response to the attacks in Jordan, again, that killed three U.S. Three US soldiers. The airstrikes uh, that took place over the weekend, uh, they were carried out on the Iranian-backed uh, militia groups in Syria, in Iraq, as well as Yemen uh, against the Houthis. Officials have said that this first phase, and they have really stressed this is phase one of the response and that more action and strikes will be carried out. I think that's interesting. Uh, the deadly calculus, of course, uh, of deterrence, which is what this is, uh, is underway. But the question is, what happens next? Uh, if missteps happen, does this escalate? Does this mean we are doomed for a broader war or bro- broader conflict in the Middle, in the Middle East? Uh, So let's break all of that down in terms of what we should be watching for. So present reality, Jack Sullivan, uh, Jake Sullivan, excuse me, communication front man on this latest military operation, uh, went on all the major networks over the weekend. Uh, He earned his his pay for sure this weekend. He talked to everybody about everything uh, when it comes to the strikes. Uh, And on each one, he started, as he did yesterday on Meet the Press, restating the goals of the administration. The president is determined to respond forcefully to attacks on our people. The president also is not looking for a wider war in the Middle East. Uh, So as he bounced around, and if you were flipping channels uh, on Sunday, you would have seen him everywhere. You might have think he had he had taken over all of the networks Uh, on uh, CNN's State of the Union with Dana Bash. Sullivan said our response will continue beyond this weekend as the attempt the focus is to reduce military capability. It's the capability issue in terms of those militias in uh, Iraq and Syria. Well, we're going to continue, as we have, to take action uh, when Americans are attacked. When we're attacked in Iraq and Syria, we'll respond. And from our perspective, 
each action that we take is targeted at reducing the capabilities of the militias to be able to continue to conduct attacks against us and to send a clear message that the United States will respond when our forces are attacked. So that was uh, Jake Sullivan on CNN. Of course, uh, we previously aired uh, one of the pieces uh, from Meet the Press. Now let's uh, continue on around the dial uh, on Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan yesterday. She asked Jake Sullivan about Secretary Blinken's latest trip to the Middle East. Sullivan said part of the priorities of the trip is to better secure humanitarian aid uh, for those that are struggling and suffering uh, inside of uh, Gaza. Secretary Blinken is on his way to the region as we speak, and this will be a top priority of his when he sees the Israeli government, that uh, the needs of the Palestinian people are something that are going to be front and center in the U.S. approach, and that we want yeah. to ensure that they are getting access to life-saving food, medicine, water, shelter, and we'll continue to press until that is done. So we're continuing to watch on that front. Again, that was Jake Sullivan talking about Secretary Blinken's latest trip. He's been on the ground since this morning, Utah time, uh, in the Middle East, again, making the rounds. But again, clearly one of the priorities is the humanitarian aid for the Palestinian people, the innocent Palestinian people who are suffering inside of Gaza. Uh, at the same time, I am sure conversations will be had with Israel in terms of what they are doing to prosecute uh, their goals, which is to root out Hamas uh, and uh, create space for something different inside of Gaza that gives the Israeli people uh, more confidence in their security day to day. So that will continue to play out. And then, of course, uh, they've also got to navigate uh, these retaliatory strikes from the United States uh, against these Iranian backed militias and groups uh, in the region and doing it in a way that reduces capacity and capability, as, uh, as uh, uh, Jake pointed out, uh, and then making sure that they're also not going too far in those or creating something that could spark a broader uh, conflict into the Middle East. Now, just before the show, uh, the Pentagon uh, held their Defense Department briefing today, and the spokesman, Brigadier General Pat Ryder, uh, who we hear from often, uh, he always gives a very thoughtful, very strategic, very detailed report of what's actually going on. And so he walked everybody through the progress on the strikes carried out over the weekend. Take a listen. Although we continue to evaluate, we currently assess that we had good effects and that the strikes destroyed or functionally damaged more than 80 targets at the seven facilities. As Secretary Austin highlighted in his statement, this is the start of our response, and there will be additional actions taken to hold the IRGC and affiliated militias accountable for their attacks on U.S. and coalition forces. We do not seek conflict in the Middle East or anywhere else, but attacks on American forces will not be tolerated, and we will continue to take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our forces, and our interests. And so as we look at all of that information coming in, again, over the weekend, these strikes, some 80 to 85 are the numbers that we continue to hear. Uh, as uh, we just listened to uh, Brigadier General Pat Ryder point out, uh, they had great effect. Seven locations that they were targeting to either destroy or inhibit the capacity, capabilities uh, of those to launch more attacks against the United States. That's an important component in all of this. Uh, we're, we are taking this action not because we want to, not because we want to just stir the pot in the Middle East. Uh, this is a retaliation uh, because of the attacks on the United States and our service members in the region. Uh, again, I think it's also uh, just worth reminding everyone uh, that those that uh, were killed last week, the three U.S. service members, the reason they were there, the re reason they were at that post is because they were working with our international partners, our allies, in making sure that ISIS is not able to reconstitute, to recalibrate, to re-recruit, uh, and to be a threat. Uh, and that's an important thing. That's your safety and my safety. Uh, that's an important mission uh, that they have been on. And when those attacks took place, again, by the Iranian-backed uh, proxies there in the region, uh, that that did demand a strike. And again, we're going to continue to watch this closely because we know there will be more. Uh, and the United States has pointed that out. It, it has been interesting. Uh, the United States has walked back uh, a few comments in terms of who we might have given a heads up to uh, before these uh, counterattacks took place over the weekend. Uh, some people have criticized the administration for giving too much advance notice 
uh, to some of these groups uh, through Iran, through other proxy nations uh, that allowed everybody to kind of get out. It's like if you know the strike is coming, it's a pretty good time to leave. Uh, and apparently uh, that did happen to some degree. We don't know for sure. So uh, we want to be careful there in terms of what actually happened. Uh, and that's part fog of war, uh, part how things are positioned. Uh, and so we'll continue to, to dig deeper on that and make sure we're actually getting to the truth. Uh, the big challenge is that we need to look at moving forward. What is the next two or three? If there's two or three more rounds of strikes that the administration is still planning on, what are they? What will the effect be? Will it be a deterrent? Uh, and then how does that continue to play out in the context of what else is going on? Remember, we still have 130 hostages, including American citizens, uh, that are still being held. And so there's a lot left to be done. There's a lot of conversations yet to be had. And we'll continue to follow all of it here on KSL News Radio on Inside Sources. We'll step aside for some bottom of the hour news. More Inside Sources coming up next. It's 2.30 at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bomas. KSL's top story this hour, KSL meteorologist Kevin Eubank says this Pineapple Express that's passed through California is now affecting Utah weather. We've already had some crazy winds. We had a semi that got toppled out over I-80 this morning because of the winds out in the West Desert, 50, 60, 70 mile an hour winds. We're going to be having rain in the valleys and snow in the mountains over the next several days. Kevin says Salt Lake City will be getting more water this first week of February than uh, it normally does in a month. With millions of taxpayer dollars already spent on keeping wolves out of Utah since 2012, one state lawmaker is questioning the oversight of that effort. I actually am very supportive of delisting wolves and having wolves under state management, but I'm not necessarily and haven't been supportive of this uh, blank check that's contributed itself through time with not much accountability. That was Representative Casey Snyder questioning Don Pay, who represents a group called Hunter Nation, at an appropriations meeting last week. Pay and Representative Darren Owens have asked for half a million dollars in new funding for that group. Our top national story this hour from ABC News. President Biden wrapping up a campaign swing in the West, spending some of his Monday in Las Vegas. ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers has the latest. President Biden stopped by a hotel in Las Vegas Monday to meet with culinary union members at an employee cafeteria. The president thanked them for their support and for continuing to have faith in their union, saying organized labor is, quote, on a roll recently. The president reiterating his message on the strength of the U.S. economy. We've created almost 15 million brand new jobs just in three years, more than any president has in American history in that period of time. Karen Travers, ABC News, Washington. Your money at this moment, the uh, Dow Jones average closing trading today down 274 points. That's where it's been most of the day. The NASDAQ is down 31 points and the S&P 500 down 15 today. And our KSL weather looks like, uh, like Kevin said, it's going to be wet. That's next. KSL News Time 231. You know what's great about KSL's traffic coverage? Trained traffic reporters and real listeners. Trading information and making the commute safer and faster for everyone. Every 10 minutes on the nines. We have you covered on KSL News Radio. Hi, this is Doug Wright. Over the years, I've talked a lot about hard water. It takes years off the life of water heaters and other appliances in your home. Leaves scum on the shower walls, and you almost need a jackhammer to remove that. I've talked about how Connecticut of Utah, an authorized Connecticut dealer, their water softeners are maintenance-free. You just don't need adjustment, and they do the job with two-thirds less salt than other softeners. But today, I want to talk about the exhilarating feeling of stepping into a hot bath or shower and feeling that pure your soft water cascade over your skin. It feels like every pore in your body wants to stand up and start singing. And afterward, there are no itchy hard water deposits sticking all over you. You really should look into a soft water system from Connecticut of Utah, an authorized Connecticut dealer. You can learn more about Connecticut by giving them a call at 801-576-8600 or log on to Softwater Utah. Connecticut of Utah, an authorized Connecticut dealer. Then sit back and enjoy your shower even more. Getting your biggest tax refund from Jackson Hewitt can lead to some spirited reactions. Jackson Hewitt! 
Hallelujah! Jackson Hewitt is so sure that you'll get your biggest refund that if they don't, you get your money back plus a hundred bucks. Jackson Hewitt! And Jackson Hewitt also guarantees the accuracy of your return for life. So don't just sit there. For your biggest refund guaranteed, walk into a Jackson Hewitt today and dance out Jackson Hewitt, yeah! I lock up my Old Spice Fiji Aluminum Free Dry Spray to keep that 24-7 lasting freshness safe for myself. Fresh coconuts, palm trees in the wind. It's like catching waves in Fiji. Actually, I just talked myself into a refreshing spritz of Fiji. My Old Spice is missing! No! <laughs> Traffic and weather together brought to you by Sinclair's Dino Pay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meese. Winter driving conditions along Highway 40 in Summit and Wasatch counties, particularly between Park City and Jordanelle, here in the valley. Freeway traffic in good shape, but we do have a crash in Weber County southbound Washington Boulevard at 28th Street, blocking a right lane in Ogden. The UA CPA supports certified professional accountants in Utah through ongoing professional education and leadership development to help them succeed in an ever-changing financial financial world. Find a CPA that's right for you at uacpa.org. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. KSL weather showers come back today, continue the next several days, and we'll also get additional snow in the mountains. Right now, uh, rain in 45 degrees. I'm Dan Bomas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com. We're Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside, Inside Sources. America's Voice of Reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. We're staying with the conversation a little bit longer as it relates to the Middle East, which is what we love to do on this show, to not just give you the up-to-date rat-a-tat-tat of the daily news cycle, but to step back and give you some historical context some things to think about, some things to think again about when it comes to what we think we know about any given topic. Uh, and nowhere is that more important than the Middle East. Uh, it is so easy for us, uh, especially here in the comfort of the United States, to conflate all of this uh, in very simple terms. And it is a complicated space. And uh, we're really th thrilled to, uh, oh, it looks like we've got a little challenge with some sound, so we'll hold on for a second there. Uh, we're going to be joined in uh, in just a moment uh, by uh, James Gelvin, professor of history at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, his research is in the social and cultural history of the modern Middle East. And so we want to dig into that just a little bit and uh, figure out a little bit of why some of these things under the radar, under the surface, things that are impacting what's going on and why. Uh, again, it's so easy to just drift across the headlines and to just get into the uh, the shouting matches and talking points, especially in this kind uh, this kind of uh, issue. Uh, and so, if you missed the previous segment of the program, we broke down the reality. So, always important: start with the present reality. Where are we right now uh, in terms of what's happening? We know that over the weekend uh, there were some 85 strikes uh, on targets by the United States in retaliation. Uh, for the drone attack that killed three uh, three U.S. service members, wounded over 40 others. Uh, again, why they were there, trying to defeat ISIS, not allowing ISIS the breathing room to reconstitute and uh, to re-engage. Uh, and so, as I said, we're staying with the conversation a little bit longer so we can get to some of the historic context of all of that. And it looks like we do have uh, James Gelvin, professor of history at UCLA, uh, again, his research is in the social and cultural history of the modern Middle East. And uh, I, I love this perspective. And uh, Dr. Galvin, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, so help us step back a little bit from all of this. It, it, it is such a struggle to not conflate all of this <laughs> uh, when we listen to what's going on in the region. Uh, this is an area that you know incredibly well. Uh, give us a little bit of a backup moment in terms of what are the dynamics culturally, socially uh, in the Middle East? And what is it that you keep your eye on, especially as it relates to all the conflict that seems to be perpetual there? Well, um, things have changed quite a bit in the last 15, 20 years in the Middle East. 
It used to be that the American writ was law, that the United States was the hegemonic power. And then uh, through a series of mishaps and things that developed within the region itself and policy changes in the United States, the United States began to walk away from that role. That began under the Obama administration and continued under the Trump administration and continued under the Biden administration as well. And as a result, there's been a lot of people who or several countries that have been trying to fill in the uh, American vacuum. Uh, on the one hand, you have Iran and, and its allies. And on the other hand, you have Saudi Arabia and its. Saudi Arabia is the supreme status quo power in the region, regional power. And Iran doesn't like the status quo. So they're at loggerheads. And what we're seeing now is a reflection of that, a reflection of American wa- America walking away, a uh, reflection of the fact that uh, there's no real parameters anymore for bringing together people within the Middle East. Mm. And so as you look at that, and I love that you bring that perspective in terms of the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, uh, what is it that uh, has created that vacuum? Has it just been a a lack of focus uh, or is it a specific change in terms of policy? We've always kind of had our fingers in there, uh, but have we moved our hands in that process? Well, um, things have changed. Uh, It used to be that the Middle East was very important to the United States. Uh, It was a source of oil. We wanted to make sure that the Soviet Union didn't uh, move into America's turf. We had allies there like Israel, for example, and Iran at a certain point in Saudi Arabia that uh, helped us out in the region. And all that has changed. And there's been several reasons for that change. Number one, the end of the Cold War. Uh, so that uh, our big problem right now is not the expansion of the Soviet Union. Uh, More importantly is the Iraq invasion that soured Americans on intervention. And um, uh, Obama set out a policy, which I feel personally was a very reasonable policy, of the Middle East is not worth it anymore. The Middle East is going to suffer incredibly through climate change. It's going to suffer by the uh, movement away from oil, Uh, There's a lot of conflicts in the region. And so the history of the 21st century, according to Obama, is going to be written in East Asia and on the Pacific Rim. And the United States should focus its its attention there. And all the U.S. has to do is to tamp down a few conflicts in the Middle East and to uh, make sure that uh, no conflicts break out in the Middle East. And we could turn our attention where it really matters. Well, we didn't get a chance to do that. We didn't get a chance to do that because of the uprisings of 2010, 2011, because of various conflicts between uh, that have been encouraged by Saudi Arabia on the one hand and Iran on the other hand. And the fact that uh, people just generally know that there is nobody there to prevent them from uh, trying to expand their influence. I mean, think of all the navies now that are in the Red Sea. You have, for example, the Saudi Navy, the American Navy, the British Navy, the Iranian Navy, the Turkish Navy, Chinese. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing what you have going on there. And so there's no sheriff in town anymore. Mm. And that's what I think is a real problem. Now, in terms of what's going on with Gaza and its relationship to all these other conflicts in the Middle East, I'm very, you know, I always think about uh, the Die Hard movies with Alan Rickman's character. Why are you doing this? Well, we want the liberation of this. We want the liberation of that and so on and so forth. That's all uh, uh, just bomb. That's not really true. What's going on now is a whole bunch of conflicts are just sort of like erupting simultaneously throughout the region. Uh, for example, uh, you have uh, the, uh, the problems in the Red Sea, the Houthis, the insurgent group within Yemen. What they're attempting to do, according to most analysts, is, well, they're showing sympathy for the Palestinians, but nobody puts their head on the line for the Palestinians Mm -hmm. in this manner. What the Houthis are doing is they're involved in negotiations now with the Saudis, and what they want is they want some sort of leverage over those negotiations. And so what they figure is by uh, targeting international shipping in the Red Sea, which Saudi Arabia borders on, uh, what they're going to be able to do is get a leg up on Saudi Arabia. What about Hezbollah, for example? Did Iran tell Hezbollah to get involved in the Gaza conflict? No. Hezbollah itself wants to stay out of the Gaza conflict. Lob and a couple of missiles every now and then. That's true. But for the most part, it doesn't want a conflict in a situation in which they are a player in Lebanese politics. And Lebanon is virtually bankrupt. And they don't want to be seen as, as the group that destroys the south of Lebanon. So we have all these conflicts that are breaking out one by one by one by one. 
Uh, and there's nobody there at the present time that can do anything about it because the United States picked up its marbles and went home. Yeah. Wow. Great perspective. Uh, Professor James Gelvin, professor of history at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, thanks for helping us get a little context, a little perspective in all of this. It's a vital part of having the right kind of conversation so we can get to the right kinds of results. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. All right. Again, that's uh, Professor James Gelvin uh, from UCLA. Uh, His research is uh, in the social and cultural history of the modern Middle East. And there are so many important things that we could unpack there uh, in terms of what each of these little groups is after, what they want and don't want, where they want to engage, where they want to occasionally lob a rocket or two, uh, but not really get into a big conflict or a big escalation. Uh, It's all posturing and positioning. uh, But I think he hit it on in terms of what the U.S. policy has been and has not been under the last three administrations. If the U.S. takes its marbles and goes home, as the professor said, uh, chaos is sort of the result. There is a vacuum there uh, that is a part. So a lot of these things we're seeing are actually symptoms of a bigger problem. We'll be back with some final thoughts on Inside Sources. Stick around. lives are full of choices these days. Some are less important. Look at all these shows and movies. I don't know what to watch. But other choices are key to the way we understand the world and our place in it. When you select KSL, listening on Alexa or in the car, you've made the right choice. You could choose to do nothing. You could opt out. So thank you for engaging, for choosing this station. KSL News Radio. It's the dead of winter, and our friends at Advanced Window Products have a wonderful wintertime offer. This is Jeff Kaplan. If the cold is seeping into your house right now, Nate and Jake will give you $2,500 off on double-pane windows and the highest quality custom frames built right here in Utah. Any style, any color, and the $2,500 is atop their already low prices. See, they build the windows, they install the windows, and they guarantee them for life. So there's no middleman markup. At Advanced Window Products, they offer 0% financing. You can save now, pay later. So take advantage in the dead of winter while the wind is whistling and give your home, your number one asset, a fresh new look. Plus, you save money on heating and air conditioning so much so the energy companies offer rebates. Buy local. Their factories right here in Salt Lake City. Save an extra $2,500 off the best windows and frames in Utah. 801-850-9100. 801-850-9100. Or visit advancedwindowsusa.com. Made to shine. Love stories from Shane Company customers. My wife's been working long weekends, so instead of just taking her out to dinner on Valentine's Day, I'm going to surprise her with a gift from Shane Company. I stop by and they show me some really beautiful diamond heart necklaces. Right away, I knew that'd be something she'd love. I hope it reminds her how much I love her every day. Our diamonds are hand matched for consistency and sparkle, so your love will shine forever. Shane Company, fine jewelry since 1929. If you only have a 401k, you're not getting the most for retirement. Wait, what? Add a Robinhood IRA on top, then they'll boost it by 3%. You can do that? And if you transfer in any retirement account, you get 3% on top of that. Is there a limit to the match? No limit. Robinhood Gold gets you the biggest contribution match of any IRA on the market. Sign up for Robinhood Gold at Robinhood.com slash boost by April 30th. Subscription fees apply. Investing involves risk. 3% match requires gold for one year from first match. Must keep IRA for five years. Match on transfers subject to Additional terms and conditions. Robin Hood Financial LLC, member SIPC. Valentine's Day is here. This year, give the ultimate gift. Name a star after your sweetheart. This is Rocky Moselle with International Star Registry. For 45 years, we've named millions of stars for celebrities, dignitaries, and individuals worldwide. For $59 and a call to 800-282-3333 or visit StarRegistry.com, you can give the most memorable gift. The star your name will be recorded in book form in the U.S. Copyright Office. Visit StarRegistry.com or call 800-282-3333. Getting help with plumbing repairs is easier than you think. All you have to do is call Any Hour Services or schedule an appointment at AnyHourServices.com. No one helps more homeowners than Any Hour Services. I guess it's human nature, Amanda, that no matter how much money we have in our savings account, it never seems like it's enough and if you find yourself in that mode right now let us uh, direct you over to our friends at uccu they are 
wanting to help you supercharge your savings. UCCU is offering high rate savings options with yields up to 5.5%. All you do is go to uccu.com and select a high rate savings option to do just what you said, supercharge your savings. You're going to get a much bigger return on your savings right now. It's a savings certificate, which means you make one deposit up front and your money grows over a fixed period of time. So you can have that grow over five years, but UCCU has created some very short term uh, savings certificates with high yields short like six months nine months or a year so you decide how long do you want to put that money you deposit money a one-time only deposit and then you let it stay in the longer it stays in there the higher the interest rate you earn and if you need immediate access to your money uccu's money market will give you a high yield and anytime access uccu you're gonna love where you bank guys did you know your testosterone affects everything in your system including how you feel and perform every day Right now, Revive Men's Health Salt Lake City will check your testosterone for free. Knowing your T levels is the first step in understanding if you have low T. Your testosterone level impacts your energy, libido, sleep, weight, hair loss, mood, and even ED. Maintaining an appropriate T level can change your whole life. Most men start to see changes in their hormone levels in their 30s. Experience and results matter. So what are you waiting for? Get your T-Levels checked today by local, experienced, and trusted men's health experts. They've helped thousands of men since 2011. They're so confident they can help you, they even guarantee it. Call Revive today and schedule your free testosterone test, free exam, and free consultation. Call Revive Men's Health at 801-263-7777. That's 801-263-7777. Or visit revivemenshealth.com. This Monday Tax Tip is brought to you by Susan Spears, CEO of the Utah Association of CPAs. The employee retention credit was a refundable tax credit that small businesses could claim during the pandemic. It provided some relief for struggling businesses that kept their employees on their payrolls, even when the government restrictions required them to shut down. While employers may still apply for ERC credits through April 15, 2024 for 2020 claims and April 15, 2025 for 2021 claims, the IRS has warned about ERC mills that are preparing false ERC claims. To find out if you're eligible, contact your CPA. Know that you will need to amend tax returns for any credits received. Get the most out of your income tax preparation when you hire a CPA. Go to uacpa.org to find a CPA that's right for you. That's uacpa.org. Listen to KSL on Monday for more tax tips from the Utah Association of CPAs. Tim and Amanda. Yes, KSL is a trusted institution. I mean, it's a hundred-year-old institution, and I know that with that legacy comes a responsibility and a trust. But I want you to know, we have diverse voices at this radio station. Young people, we have people of all different ages, of all different cultural backgrounds who put their two cents into what stories we cover from day to day. We also are young in terms of our employees. When I've been kicking around the Salt Lake City market for 40 years, I felt like I needed a decade of radio under my belt before I even attempted to climb that mountain. So as important as KSL is to you, you need to know that it's an important institution for both of us and something that we take very seriously in the responsibility of providing the right news and information for you and your families every day and carrying on the tradition of this great radio station. Utah's Morning News between 5 and 9 on KSL News Radio. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bomas. First, a state legislator is questioning the need to keep funding a program meant to keep wolves out of Utah. Second, Utah feeling the effects of the Pineapple Express weather system that's hit Southern California. And third, President Biden met with union workers at a campaign stop today in Las Vegas. Right now, 45 degrees with rain in Salt Lake City. And back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Hear elevated conversation on crucial issues. Boyd Matheson on Inside Sources. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today, as it always is. I am Boyd Matheson. As we round out the program today, uh, I actually began the show by declaring it to be Groundhog Day. Uh, and don't try to adjust your dial. No, it, it is not uh, Friday, February the 2nd. It is Monday the 5th, uh, and it is Groundhog Day uh, when it comes to border security and immigration reform in this country. 
because we keep having the same conversation politically over and over and over again. And this is really just a symptom. What's going on is a symptom of the deeper problem. And the deeper problem is that Congress has ceased to be Congress. Uh, And they are much more interested in political conversations and running campaigns than they are in running the government. For you, that's their job. Uh, Not to be the government, it's we the people. Uh, They work for you. And sadly, we've got that flipped, and that's become a bit of its own Groundhog Day. Uh, And it's just been stunning to me over the weekend uh, to just see how unhinged so many members of Congress, presidents, presidential campaigns uh, have become over a very simple bill that is supposed to secure the border and help fix some of the immigration problems. But the reality is, is this is so much more than that because it's political. So the problem really begins with the fact that this is not just a border security and immigration bill. It also has funding uh, for aid uh, to Ukraine. That's the biggest chunk of money in the bill goes to Ukraine. Uh, The second biggest chunk of money goes actually to Israel uh, and aid to Israel. And then you've got things for uh, Gaza in terms of humanitarian efforts there. You've got things relating to Taiwan uh, and uh, that part of the world. And then you have this border component. And just in case you think that's too many things to have in a bill, uh, and this is why we always wait on this show to actually read the bill text. As the bill text was released on Sunday night, it was also noted that the bill includes almost $3 billion uh, for uranium enrichment. Now, you might say, that well, that's a good thing, because obviously uh, Russia is one of the largest producers of uranium worldwide. We'd obviously like to be less dependent when it comes to uranium and those kinds of uh, critical minerals. So you can say, well, that's a very good thing. $3 billion in the grand scheme of uh, congressional spending is not a big deal. But this is how we get to big deals, like $34 trillion in national debt. It happens $3 billion here. Three billion there. You wrap a few things into one bill that has is supposed to be about border security and immigration, and then it's got Israel and Ukraine and Taiwan, uh, and suddenly you got a very muddled mess. And that's why it becomes very easy for people of all the political parties uh, to start picking and saying, "Wait a minute, we shouldn't be doing this, or it shouldn't include that." Uh, and it's why we are where we are, because we have failed just a really simple process. If we just went to single-issue bills, like, okay, we want to talk about uranium? Let's talk about uranium. Let's do that. You want to talk about border security? Let's just talk about that component of it. Want to fix the immigration system? Let's talk about that. And the reality is we'd get a lot of these things solved if we took that approach. But instead, we bundle them all together in big, massive bills, uh, and then we just have these uh, crazy shouting matches for a couple of days, and everybody goes back. Everyone picks up their fundraising checks and continues on the campaign trail, which is especially what we do in presidential election years. So the interesting thing to me is you look at how you break all of this down. Uh, The the bill is currently in the Senate. That is where it was originated. Uh, That's where it will be debated. The question will be, will there there be any kind of amendment process? Uh, Probably not. The messages that are being put out are like, we don't have time. We have to hurry because we need to deal with Ukraine and we need to get aid there. That's a good debate. That's a good conversation. We should have that on the floor of the United States Senate, but not in the context of an immigration bill or a border security bill. And so sadly, what ends up happening is it all gets conflated. It all gets uh, deconstructed. And then it's very easy for people to say, that's uh, I'm not in. Uh, Count me out. And so we've already seen that on the Republican side. The Republicans have been battling amongst themselves in terms of what is and isn't in the bill uh, and what the bill really means. Again, read the bill text. I encourage you to read the bill text if you have questions about it, because even when it says things like there is funding for the border wall in the bill, uh, it does say that. So that is, in fact, true. It is also true that the legislative text says that the president can take that money and suspend it to the fiscal year 2028. 
which means no money needs to be spent on the border wall. Again, whether you want a border wall or don't want a border wall, it's an interesting thing to say, oh, this is about border wall. In reality, it's about not border wall. <laughs> and so then you end up with people, again, the Republicans are having their own debate. Uh, if you're really watching it in the Senate, I think the person to watch in the Senate is Democrat Robert Menendez uh, and Alex Padilla from California. Uh, Menendez, of course, is from New Jersey. Uh, and he said something that rang true to me across the political spectrum. And he's going to be the quote of the day today. So to his Democratic colleagues, he said, if these changes in the bill that is now before the Senate were being considered under President Trump's administration, Democrats would be in outrage. But because we want to win an election, we are going to put Latinos and immigrants on the altar of sacrifice.